journalism is under relentless assault. You know that. Whether it's the contentious relationship that the press has uh, with with the the current administration, or whether it's you know um, the fact that the economic models for news organizations is is at uh, under threat, it is still a more hopeful time than ever to be a journalist, and um, stick to it because whether you go into a traditional newsroom or you create something. The thing that is not going to change is the need for journalism in this country. Journalism is an an essential part of American democracy. It truly is. The democracy as we know it would not would not exist without journalists. And there, you're you're also we're also living in a time of great entrepreneurship. You can create the next thing that will become a Pulitzer winner, something I'm not even thinking about, that the board isn't thinking about, that doesn't even know exists. You can create new forms of storytelling, uh, uh, or you can become the next you know, White House correspondent, or you can, you can do science journalism and it, or, uh, or focus on climate change. The platforms may change, the news organizations may change, but the fundamental need for this work this critical work to our democracy will endure. And is it, it's important to, our, to the success of our country. And so when you think about what you want to do with your careers, keep that in mind. We need you. Could you describe the philosophy behind delaying the announcements this year due to COVID? There was no philosophy. It literally was um, in fairness to the finalists and an issue of logistics. And what I mean by that specifically is that many of our board members are top journalists and they are covering the pandemic or their newsrooms are. And so they have been obviously, you know, really focused on that work. And they wanted to make sure that they gave each finalist uh, its due in terms of evaluating the work. And rather than rush through that, and there was no reason to do that, we decided to delay uh, very briefly by about two weeks, really to give the board more time to evaluate uh, the finalists. Her follow-up question was, would the committee consider doing the same thing again? Under extraordinary circumstances, obviously we, we, we would do it you know, as needed, but uh, there's no reason to delay permanently. You know, we will have a schedule if we're in a place next year uh, where there's a need to let, to delay, obviously we would do that because we always want that the, the priority is to give is to give the work uh, it's it's just consideration. Though we are always uh, thinking about our categories and um, you know whether we need to add or or tweak some. In terms of the pandemic, I think we're going to have to be we're going to have to find a way to be accommodating to things like you know. Um, theater that is 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 not being performed now uh, to to make sure that that's a rich category. I think you are going to see. I think next year is going to be incredibly difficult in terms of uh, judging of the prizes because there's so much amazing work going on right now. Work that will become part of American history. Can you tell us anything about the nomination or selection process? We have more than 70 journalists in journalism and also in arts and letters who spend months and months evaluating the work and they put forward um, their nominees, their finalists to the board. The board then spends months uh, evaluating that work and meets usually over two days, though we did it over three days um, this year because we were, we were doing, uh, doing it over Zoom. Uh, for the first time. And then the board, after amazing discussion and debate, uh, votes on the winners. And then we, as you see, you just saw, I announced them today. Anastasia's follow-up question on that was, what is the process for getting on the selection committee? So the selection committee is really jurors. And the jurors rotate year to year. I choose a lot of them. And with, um, in consultation with the board, Former jurors suggest people, working journalists or novelists or, or uh, you know, authors in general, uh, people in the music industry can suggest jurors. And then I choose uh, the first round of jurors and then take that to the board and we, we, we come up with a final list. 
in terms of, uh, so that's the nominating process. For the judging process, to, to, to be considered for the Pulitzer Prize board, you know, you obviously have to be doing stellar work and at the top of your game in your field and then, um, you know, come to the radar of, of the Pulitzer board and then each potential board member is vetted and then invited to join. There's a lot of interest in the audio prize this year. Mm -hmm. And the first question about audio is, what was the rationale behind the Pulitzers adding audio reporting while it hasn't included broadcast news before? Sure. So we are increasingly trying to be as platform neutral as possible uh, and really honoring the best in journalism across platforms. And in doing that, we were seeing that we uh, were getting a lot, a lot more multimedia elements, podcasts and so forth. In, uh, as part of our regular uh, prep packages so for, or, or entrance. For example, you might have um, some journalism in, let's say, investigative reporting that already includes a podcast some other and some multimedia elements. And so we thought, well, hmm, let's see if we were to create a category for audio and we, we were doing this on an experimental basis, though it could very well become permanent because we had an amazing winner this year. Uh, what would come forth in terms of the quality of the work. And we had amazing results with that. In terms of, of, of other forms of storytelling, whether it's broadcast or, or who, who knows what's on the horizon, we very well may consider that. Every, we have a review committee on the board, and the review committee does just that. We think about where we are, where we need to go, what needs to be tweaked, what categories might need to be either fortified or, or added. And so that is an ongoing process that, that the board um, engages in every year. What was different and unique when you were considering the pieces of audio journalism for the prizes as opposed to other um, nominations, nominees? Well, the, the amazing thing is, is even though the form is different and it's fascinating to evaluate um, work that isn't text-based uh, or vis visual, what is fascinating is that what we fundamentally were looking for was the very same thing. Excellence, excellence in journalism, um, deeply sourced, deeply reported um, journalism. And that's what we got. The next question for, also from Take Glass is, how do you think the COVID-19 pandemic will affect next year's selection? <laughs> My gosh, it's going to make it hard to, uh, to judge a lot of the work because there is amazing journalism being done in the public interest. And I think it's gonna be across categories. And I also think it's not gonna be contained just to journalism. I think in arts and letters, you're gonna see a lot of work reflecting this historic and, and, and unfortunately tragic time we're living through. But I think we were all going to be very proud next year when we see the work that's put forth and what ultimately wins uh, across categories. And by the way, there's a lot of, before the pandemic, there was a lot of other amazing work going on this year that I think will also be nominated. But for sure, there's gonna be a lot of focus on this because that's, that's where uh, many news organizations are, are putting the bulk of their resources, understandably and appropriately so. The next question is, Will the Pulitzer Prizes include rewards to data journalism works in the future? It's interesting. We already do, in a sense, which is that the entries that we receive, many of them, uh, include data journalism or include podcasts or other forms of, of you know, storytelling, multimedia elements. In terms of whether we would ever create a, a, a specific category for that, you know, I don't know, but the answer really is the true answer is we are, and this is this is very sincere. Every year we look at our categories and 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 ask ourselves, you know, do, do we need to open up uh, the prizes to to new categories? And and obviously we want to do that judiciously because we want to protect the integrity of the prizes and all. The, but 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 the prizes have evolved. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that magazines weren't allowed. Uh, into the prizes. And you see today the New Yorker won and in more than one category. Well, how do you think journalists from all around the world should cooperate when people in the world are facing similar crises like COVID-19 this year? Another well, question. I can't speak to people around the world, but I, I can certainly speak to journalism around the world. I think it's happening already. Whether it's reporting uh, that's going on in, in parts of China or in Europe, 
Um, uh, I think a lot of the work that we're going to see that comes before the Pulitzer Board next year will be COVID-related work, not just in the United States, but around the world. I think that is actually already happening. What are some of the common themes or qualities in this year's Pulitzer Prize winning work? I would say there were there are two. The, the huge news organizations with big resources uh, continue to do amazing work in the public interest. You know, holding the government accountable on big stories, spending the resources to go wherever a story takes them. But I think the thing that I'm as proud of uh, and that the board is, is that you'll see, if you look at the list of winners, we also had some very small scrappy news organizations that with, with, with um, very few resources uh, relative to the large news organizations are still doing Pulitzer-worthy work. And I think that speaks to the fact, something that's relevant for all of you as budding journalists, is that all of us, whether you work at a huge news organization, I was at the New York Times for 23 years, but I've also worked at smaller news organizations, and, 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 and you all, um, this I think will ring true to many of you, consider this work a calling and an important part of American democracy. And so whether you're working for a small news organization or, or one with the deepest pockets, um, we all take this work seriously and are, are trying to deliver news and information in the public interest every day. And I think that's something that we can all be proud of. Is there any unifying factor that distinguishes this year's creative nominees and winners? I think that across categories, what you could say, in the arts uh, and arts and letters categories, and I think this is true most years, is it's work that moves you. Whether it makes you angry, whether it makes you cry, or whether it makes you laugh. And that's true to some extent in, uh, in the journalism categories as well, certainly in editorial cartooning, uh, certainly in photography, but I think that's the theme that emerges every year, is that the work has to stir you move something in you, whether it's a play that you identify with or something that helps you to see someone else's point of view in a way that you hadn't considered before. Those are the universal themes. And a follow-up question on that was, are there any unifying factors or trends among this year's nominees and winners in general? Those themes are excellence in the work and something that either makes you question something, spurs you to act, makes you angry, makes you more empathetic to someone else's point of view, those are the themes. And, and really superb work, whether it's a book or, or a song or, or an, a photograph or, or an amazing piece of journalism, that's what, what, what that work has in common. 